the threat of war. Circumstances are only difficult for those who shrink from the tomb. Saint Just. It is useful here to present a few counter arguments to the repudiations voiced by some people and the evasions of others by means of a small number of unequivocal assertions. One. Conflict and life are one and the same thing. A man's value depends on his aggressive strength. Two, a living man sees death as the fulfillment of life. He does not regard it as a misfortune. On the other hand, a man who does not have the strength to find something bracing in his death is already somewhat dead. Three, if the intention is to discover the limits of human destiny, then it is impossible to remain alone and a veritable church must be formed, laying claims to a spiritual power and at the same time establishing a force that can be developed and is capable of influencing others. In the present circumstances, such a church would have to accept and even seek out the conflict within which it would assert its existence. But in terms of essentials, this church would need to bring the conflict in line with its own interests, in other words, with the conditions of a fulfillment of human potential. 4. War cannot be reduced to an expression or a means to develop an ideology, even one founded on military aggression. On the contrary, it is ideologies that become reduced to being just another weapon in the conflict. In every respect, war exceeds the contradictory words that are spoken on these occasions. 5. Fascism subordinates all values to the service of its struggle and its work. The fate of the church we are attempting to define here must be linked to values that are neither military nor economic. There should be no difference, as far as it is concerned, between existing and opposing a closed system of servitude. At the same time, it should maintain its distance from the national interest or the fine words of the democracies. 6. The values of this church should be of the same order as the traditional considerations which put tragedy at the apex. Independently of political results, however, it is impossible to see any descent from our human universe to the various domains of hell as something that has no meaning. But as regards the infernal, it ought to be possible only to speak about it in a modest manner without either lowering our voices or shouting about it. The practice of joy in the face of death. All this I am and wish to be, at the same time dove, serpent, and pig. Nietzsche. When a human being finds himself situated in such a way that the world is reflected happily within him and there is no chance of it leading to destruction or suffering, as on a beautiful spring morning, he can allow himself to go along with the enchantment or the simple joy that result. But at the same moment he may also notice the dullness and the inconsequential concerns of empty repose which such bliss actually signifies. At this point, what rises up in him so bitterly is like a bird of prey ready to tear out the throat of a small bird in a blue sky that seems peaceful and clear. He sees that he cannot fulfill his life without giving in to some inexorable impulse, and feels its violence going to work in the most inaccessible part of his being, with a rigour he finds frightening. If he looks back at others, who do not go any further than this state of bliss, he feels no hatred. On the contrary, he feels sympathy for such necessary happiness. He is only at odds with those who claim to be fulfilling their lives, and to act out their risk-free charades so that they become known for having reached fulfilment, when all they have done is talk about fulfilment. But it is much to be preferred if all this does not end up making him feel light-headed, for his light-headedness exhausts him and puts him in danger of being quickly flung into a new concern that he is happy in his leisure time, or, failing that, finds a painless existence. Or, if he does not give in, but continues in his fearful haste to tear himself apart right to the end, he enters into death in such a way that nothing could be more horrible. The only one who can be truly happy here is the one who, 
having felt light-headed until the point where all his bones were shaking and it was no longer possible to gauge how far he had fallen, suddenly regains the unexpected power to be able to change his last gasp into a joy powerful enough to freeze and transfigure any who come into contact with it. Yet the only ambition that can take hold of a man who, with calm and even temper, sees his life reach its fulfilment in this tearing apart, cannot lay claim to greatness when it depends entirely on chance for its power to take effect. This kind of violent resolution, which bars him from finding any peace, does not necessarily entail either his light-headedness or a fall into sudden death. It may instead become in him the action and power by means of which he dedicates himself to that rigour whose workings tirelessly snap shut as sharply as the beak of a bird of prey. Contemplation is no more than the expanse, sometimes calm and sometimes stormy, across which the swift force of his action must be put to the test at one time or another. The mystical existence of the one whose joy in the face of death has become an inner violence cannot under any circumstances arrive at a bliss that is satisfying in and of itself, such as the bliss of Christians which grants a foretaste of eternity. The mystic who contemplates joy in the face of death cannot be regarded as trapped owing to the fact of his amused laughter at everything a human being is able to do and because he knows every spell it is possible to know. Yet the totality of life, ecstatic contemplation and lucid knowledge being fulfilled in a process which cannot fail to be dangerous is just as inexorably his lot as death is for the condemned man. The texts that follow cannot by themselves constitute an initiation into the exercising of a mystical understanding of joy in the face of death. If we accept that such a method might indeed exist, these texts do not even represent a part of it. While verbal initiation is itself difficult, it is impossible in the space of a few pages to give anything but the vaguest outline of something that is, by its nature, so difficult to comprehend. Taken as a whole, these writings are, furthermore, not so much exercises in the proper sense of the word as simple descriptions of a contemplative state or of ecstatic contemplation. These descriptions might not even be acceptable if they were not given for what they are, in other words, freely. Only the text that appears first could, at a stretch, be seen as an exercise. While there is a case for using the word mystical with reference to joy in the face of death, and its practice, this indicates no more than an effective similarity between this practice and those of the religious peoples of Asia or Europe. There is no reason to associate this joy, which has no other object than the life at hand, with a certain presupposition concerning some other supposedly profound reality. Joy in the face of death belongs only to the one for whom it is not from beyond. It is the only intellectually honest path that the search for ecstasy may follow. Moreover, how could a beyond, or God, or anything at all like God, still be considered acceptable? No words are sufficiently clear to express the happy contempt of the one who dances with the time that kills him, for those who find refuge in the anticipation of eternal bliss. This kind of timorous holiness, which right from the start had to be shielded from erotic excesses, has now lost all its power. The only reaction can be to laugh at a sacred intoxication which sought to make itself consistent with a holy horror of debauchery. Prudery is perhaps a wholesome thing for the misguided, yet whoever would be afraid of naked girls and whiskey would have very little time for joy in the face of death. Only a shameless, immodest holiness can lead to a sufficiently happy loss of self. Joy in the face of death means that life can be glorified from its roots to its summit. It deprives of all meaning anything that is an intellectual or moral beyond, whether substance, God, immutable order, or salvation. It is an apotheosis of the perishable, an apotheosis of the flesh and of alcohol, as well as the trance states of mysticism. The religious forms it rediscovers are the primitive forms that preceded the intrusion of servile morality, it revives that type of tragic jubilation that man is once he ceases to behave like a cripple, taking pride in necessary work and allowing himself to be emasculated by the fear of tomorrow. 1. 
I give myself up to peace until my annihilation. The sounds of struggle are lost in death like rivers in the sea, like the brilliance of stars in the night. The power of conflict is fulfilled in the silence of all action. I enter into peace as into a dark unknown. I fall into this dark unknown. I myself become this dark unknown. 2. I am joy in the face of death. Joy in the face of death upholds me. Joy in the face of death casts me down. Joy in the face of death annihilates me. I remain in this annihilation and from there imagine nature as a play of forces expressed in a multiple and never-ending death agony. In this way I slowly become lost in meaningless and endless space. I reach the end of worlds. I am gnawed at by death. I am gnawed at by fever. I am absorbed into the darkness of space. I am annihilated in joy in the face of death. 3. I am joy in the face of death. The depths of the sky, the emptiness of space, this is joy in the face of death. Everything is deeply cracked. I picture the earth spinning giddily in the heavens. I picture the heavens themselves slipping, spinning, and becoming used up. The sun like an alcohol, spinning and exploding until out of breath, the depths of the sky like a debauch of icy light becoming lost, all that exists destroying itself, consuming itself and dying, each moment only bringing itself forth in the annihilation of the one that came before and itself only existing with fatal wounds, I too destroying and consuming myself endlessly within myself, in a great festival of blood. I picture the frozen moment of my own death. Note, one night in a dream, X feels he has been pierced by lightning. He understands that he is dying and is at once miraculously dazzled and transfigured. At this moment in his dream, he reaches the unexpected, but then wakes up. Four. I fix a point in front of me and picture this point as the locus of all existence and all unity, all separation and all anguish, all unsatisfied desire and all death that is possible. I cling to this point and a deep love for what is in this point burns away at me until I refuse to continue living for any other reason than for what is there, for that point which, being together the life and death of the beloved being, thunders like a cataract. And at the same time it is essential that all external representations are stripped away from what is there until it is nothing but pure violence, an interiority, a pure inner fall into a limitless abyss, this point endlessly absorbing the whole cataract of the nothingness within it, in other words, what is vanished, past and in the same movement endlessly prostituting a sudden apparition to the love that seeks in vain to grasp what will cease to be. The impossibility of being satisfied in love is a guide for the leap to fulfillment, at the same time as being the nullification of all possible illusion. 5. If I picture myself in a vision, within a circle of light that transfigures the ecstatic and exhausted face of a dying being, what radiates from this face of necessity lights up the clouds in the sky, whose glimmering grayness thereby becomes more penetrating than the light of the sun itself. In this representation, death appears to be of the same nature as the illuminating light, insofar as the latter fades away after leaving its source. It appears that no less a loss than death is needed for the spark of life to journey through and transfigure dull existence, since only its wrenching free can become in me the power of life and time. And so I cease to be anything except the mirror of death, just as the universe is only the mirror of light. 6. Heracletian Meditation
and I am war. I picture a human movement and rebellion which are limitless in their potential. This movement and this rebellion can only be appeased by war. I picture the gift of an infinite suffering of blood and bodies opened up in the image of an ejaculation, knocking down the one it shakes and leaving him to an exhaustion racked with nausea. I picture the earth projected into space like a woman screaming with her head on fire. Before the terrestrial world, whose summer and winter regulate the death agony of everything that is alive, before the universe formed of countless spinning stars that fade away and consume themselves beyond measure, all I can see is a succession of cruel splendors whose movement alone is enough to require my death. This death is merely an explosive consumption of all that was, the joy of existing felt by everything that comes into the world, up until my own life requires that everything that is, and in all places, endlessly gives itself up and disappears into nothingness. I picture myself covered with blood, broken but transfigured, and in harmony with the world at the same time a victim and one of the jaws of time, which is constantly killing and constantly killed. Almost everywhere there are explosives, and it will perhaps not be too long before they put out my eyes. I laugh when I think that these eyes continue to ask for objects that cannot destroy them. <laughs>